Welcome to the Better Medicare Alliance 2021 Summit. This session is entitled Medicare Advantages Ability to Address the Needs of COVID. Good afternoon. My name is Millicent Gorham. I am the Executive Director of the National Black Nurses Association. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our featured speakers, Zach Gaumer. Zach Gaumer is a principal at Health Management Associates. He is an accomplished policy analyst and project manager with nearly 20 years of health policy experience. He possesses a deep understanding of Medicare and health payment systems. Prior to, to joining HMA, Zach was a principal policy analyst at the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. And let me introduce Elaine Henry. Elaine is a consultant with Health Management Associates with clinical experience in maternal and reproductive health. She is well versed on clinical, on electronic health records platform use and analyzing medical charts. Today, Better Mer Medicare Alliance is releasing a report entitled The COVID-19 Response, Differences in Medicare Advantage and Fee-for-Service in Meeting Beneficiary and Provider Needs. Following the presentation by Zach and Elaine, we will be joined by Stephen Green of Chin Med, Lisa Trumbull of Soho Health, and Dr. Paul Sherman of Community Health Plan of Washington. Zach and Elaine, take it away. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you today uh, to talk about the report that we've done uh, with BMA. Uh, in the spring of 2020, federal policymakers, health providers, health plans quickly responded to mitigate the challenges of COVID-19. Congress and CMS waived specific regulations and created greater flexibility for beneficiaries, providers, and plans to gain access to care and operate. Medicare Advantage plans rapidly adopted these flexibilities and also leveraged key attributes of the MA model to further extend support to providers and beneficiaries. Under the leadership of the Better Medicare Alliance, Health Management Associates engaged in a qualitative research project to understand the challenges of 2020 and the actions Medicare Advantage plans took during 2020 to mitigate those challenges and providers' perceptions of the support supplied by Medicare Advantage plans compared to the support supplied by fee-for-service Medicare. While COVID-19 has been devastating, it also offers a good opportunity to assess differences in healthcare uh, delivery between fee-for-service Medicare and Medicare Advantage health plans. The findings of this analysis are clear. While fee-for-service Medicare made significant efforts to assist providers and beneficiaries during 2020, Medicare Advantage health plans were able to offer providers and beneficiaries additional support due to the financial, administrative, and benefit flexibilities that are built into the Medicare Advantage model. Next slide, please. During this presentation, my colleague Elaine Henry and I will walk you through the design of our research methodology, the three components of our findings, and our key conclusions. We welcome your questions and we'll take those at the end of the presentation. And with that, I hand it over to Elaine. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, next, I'll discuss our methodology and scope of work. So as we are aware, we're still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This public health emergency has led to a dramatic loss of human life and has greatly disrupted our healthcare delivery system and has altered how Medicare, Medicare beneficiaries receive care. The beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in the spring of 2020 resulted in a surge in demand for hospital services and provider shortages. Across the country, the healthcare system experienced a sharp decline in the delivery of non-urgent but needed healthcare services. In large part, disruptions were caused in response to treat patients infected with the virus while also limiting the transmission of the virus. These disruptions have disproportionately impacted Medicare beneficiaries who are older and more likely to have chronic conditions and therefore at greater risk of having severe complications related to contracting COVID-19. Our research is a reflection of the perception of Medicare Advantage health plans and providers in 2020. 
to identify the challenges of COVID-19 in 2020 and to understand the perspectives of health plans and providers, our work was conducted in three phases. First, our team conducted a literature review to identify the challenges the healthcare, healthcare delivery system faced in 2020. The literature review helped to frame our interview questions for the next phase, which was the completion of stakeholder interviews with Medicare Advantage plans and provider organizations to, to assess the impact of the pandemic. Our final phase was the completion of a white paper to address our findings, including the top challenges providers and health plans face, their policies or programs implemented to mitigate the challenges, and the key differences between health plans and fee-for-service Medicare. Our stakeholder interviews were significant in the completion of our research study. We completed a total of 18 interviews with both MA plans and provider organizations. We interviewed six MA plans, which included a variation organization scope, geographic location, and plan type. For instance, Plan E on your screen is a local plan based out of Ohio and is a provider-led Medicare Advantage organization. Additionally, we conducted 12 interviews with provider organizations ranging again from organization scope, geographic location, and the type of service provided. As you'll see on your screen, we spoke with a variety of provider types, including behavioral health providers, physician groups, health systems, and others. The primary questions that informed our interviews include, what were the top challenges your organization faced in 2020? What flexibilities and or policy changes help mitigate your challenges? What were the key differences between the responses of fee-for-service Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans? We also asked interviewees about virtual care, care management, patients with chronic illness, direct patient outreach, staff fatigue, and capitation versus fee-for-service Medicare, fee-for-service reimbursement. Sorry. So next I'll discuss the research findings from our literature review. The literature review highlighted several challenges healthcare providers experienced in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. These top eight challenges had a direct impact on delivery of healthcare services in 2020. They include patient visit volumes decline, which caused revenue and cash flow decline for providers. Rapidly changing Medicare policies caused confusion and complicated billing. Providers were forced to temporarily close their offices, which caused financial strain. Social distancing reduced demand for preventative care and chronic care management. Patient case complexity increased due to stress and social isolation. Expanded infection control procedures increased burden on providers and rapid implementation of virtual care services, as well as provider burnout and fatigue. And so to a certain degree, many of these challenges continue to impact the delivery of healthcare services as the COVID-19 pandemic persists in 2021. For the next few slides, I'm going to discuss major themes that were highlighted from our interviews with representatives from Medicare Advantage plans. In all, MA plans leverage their unique flexibilities and organizational capabilities to support providers and beneficiaries during the COVID-19 pandemic. So while Medicare Advantage plans were able to leverage the flexibilities implemented by CMS or fee-for-service Medicare during 2020, MA plans also took various independent actions during this time to expand on those flexibilities, help beneficiaries get needed care and reduce their risk of exposure to COVID-19. Risk stratification was a common theme noted in our interviews. Um, risk stratification methods enabled health plans to identify and engage beneficiaries with the most pressing needs. Health plans leverage access to internal beneficiary data sets to stratify patients as this enabled them to prioritize outreach more efficiently to beneficiaries. And for our next few slides, you'll see direct quotes that are incorporated, but for the sake of time, I will not read them all. However, this quote on your screen um, highlights risk stratification from a national health plan. So we reached out to members using risk stratification and predictive modeling approaches to determine which beneficiaries to reach out to. Once we began to see their needs, we set up partnerships that could provide meals and transportation for members. Another theme highlighted was the repurposing of health plan staff to facilitate member and provider engagement and outreach. Several MA plans indicated they leveraged staff mm -hmm. managers to broaden outreach efforts to beneficiaries. Another theme highlighted was that additional payments and equipment from health plans eased providers' financial concerns and supported the development of new capabilities. Nearly all health plans interviews stated that they have some subcapitated payment arrangements with provider partners. According to the health plan, these payment arrangements provided more predictable revenue streams to providers, leading to greater financial stability for the providers in 2020. The next thing that we highlight is that targeted education initiatives supported efforts to provide timely and accurate information to beneficiary and providers. All health plans data is important to ensure that both beneficiaries and providers have access to updated, comprehensive, and accurate information regarding changes such as coverage policies, provider availability, COVID-19 testing and vaccine availability, COVID-19 safety protocols, and other necessary information. The final theme highlighted 
And our study was that nearly all inlay plans leveraged local community relationships and newly available supplemental benefit flexibility to address important non-medical needs. One local health plan actually stated that their organization leveraged strong relationships in the community to encourage donations for needed services. For instance, the plan's case manager called the local pet store to provide donations for members with dogs that were either unable to travel for or unable to afford dog food. So this summarizes um, the major themes that came up during our interviews with the May plan representatives. So next I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Zach Gallmer, to discuss the interview findings from speaking with provider organizations. Zach? Hey, thank you very much, Elaine. Um, so as Elaine noted earlier, uh, we interviewed several provider organizations in the course of this project, which ranged in size, geography, and type of service. And I wanna underscore that we interviewed health systems, physician practices, mental health providers, FQHCs, and nursing facilities. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the eight themes that we repeatedly heard from the providers we interviewed. Um, and these are themes about what support provider, health plans provided to providers during 2020 and how it differed or was similar to support provided by fee-for-service Medicare. Uh, next slide, please. The number one message we heard during our interviews with providers was that capitated payment arrangements and advanced payments from health plans prov offered providers greater flexibility and financial support at a time when patient visit volumes were low and unpredictable. Capitated payments and advanced payments enabled providers to manage patient care uh, absent the constraints of fee-for-service. With greater financial flexibility, providers conducted more frequent outreach to patients and, and the more predictable reimbursement reduced providers' anxiety about remaining solvent in 2020. Uh, just like the last series of slides, to the right, you can see a direct quote from providers. And in this case, we were told, the con contractual MA structure allowed us to manage MA patients aggressively. We knew MA patients would be coming despite volume declines. So we provide quotes throughout here. We're gonna focus mostly on the messaging, but you can see the quotes if you have uh, curiosity about ex exact experiences. So moving down the slide, the next theme is that providers stated that health plans were very good in 2020 at communicating important information to both patients and providers. Plans implemented education campaigns to convey information via text messaging, email, and phone. These efforts reduced the burden on physicians to conduct uh, outreach to patients and helped patients adapt to life in quarantine. Third, providers highlighted the various supplemental benefits offered by plans, which gave patients social supports that were desperately needed for the most isolated and elderly beneficiaries. Providers spoke highly of prescription drug home delivery benefits offered as a supplemental benefit or grocery home delivery benefits offered as a supplemental benefit. These were used by several of the providers that we talked to, and they claimed that they were still using them today in 2021 to serve patients that were quarantining uh, because of the COVID pandemic. Fourth, several providers stated that health plans were quick to clarify and confirm coverage for virtual care services during 2020. In particular, providers noted that while fee-for-service Medicare took a few months to clarify coverage of audio-only telehealth visits, some plans very rapidly informed providers that the plan would cover these services. Providers viewed audio-only visits as critical to ensuring access to care for patients during 2020. The next slide, please. Providers also stated that during 2020, many health plans augmented their care management services by increasing the frequency of patient outreach. Providers told us that in some cases, plans were doing so much patient outreach that it allowed the providers to be more efficient with whom uh, they themselves reached out to and ease the burden on providers who were suffering from treatment fatigue. Um, and also allowed providers to focus on patients with other forms of insurance, including fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries who were not receiving outreach from plans. This fee-for-service spillover effect was a fascinating aspect of this care coordination theme. 
Uh, next on the list, providers mentioned that both Medicare Advantage plans and fee-for-service Medicare were good at paying claims quickly, but in a few markets, the MA plans were slightly faster at paying claims, and this was a big concern for providers in light of declining patient volumes that were concerned about their solvency for the year. Next, every provider we interviewed stated that CMS's fee-for-service Medicare coverage flexibilities were critical during 2020. Uh, in particular, providers noted that clinical scope of practice flexibilities and virtual care coverage flexibilities were essential to, to their survival during the pandemic and were also very key to patients and their interests. And finally, providers consistently stated that they observed no difference between Medicare Advantage plans and fee-for-service Medicare with regard to the gui their guidance on COVID-19 uh, testing and vaccination programs. Many viewed these largely as state and local policy issues, but there was not a difference between fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage. Okay, next slide, please. So Elena and I have covered a lot of detail on this subject, uh, and I'm gonna wrap this up with a few key takeaways. And if you seek more detail, I recommend you take a look at the report that's coming out today, uh, which should be available on BMA's website. Next slide, please. So Medicare Advantage plans and fee-for-service Medicare did make extraordinary efforts to mitigate the various challenges caused by COVID-19 during 2020. Challenges like social isolation, provider fatigue, low visit volume, and provider solvency issues. Our interviews revealed several key differences in response uh, in the responses of Medicare Advantage plans relative to fee-for-service Medicare. These responses were all derived from the greater flexibility built into the Medicare Advantage model. We think of these responses or actions in three categories of flexibilities. First, the MA model offers greater financial flexibility. We observe plans using subcapitated arrangements with providers, making advanced payments to providers, and being very quick about making claims payments. Second, the MA model offers benefit flexibilities, which allows plans to offer benefits beyond the scope of fee-for-service Medicare benefits. We observe specifically great appreciation and use of supplemental benefits during 2020, like at-home delivery of prescription drugs or groceries, as well as, as, well as uh, rapid coverage of key virtual care services. Third, the MA model offers greater administrative flexibility, we observe plans investing significant resources in risk strat stratification processes used to identify high-risk patients, broader care management efforts, and the redeployment of staff to serve in care management roles, uh, and extensive communication and education programs for beneficiaries and providers. Overall, the many additional efforts made by Medicare Advantage plans during 2020 appear to have been facilitated by the flexibility of the Medicare Advantage model itself and appear to have provided needed support to providers and beneficiaries. Together, these findings demonstrate the impactful role that Medicare Advantage plans played in improving healthcare delivery during 2020 and points to the continued importance of advancing policies that support greater flexibility within the Medicare Advantage model. Next slide, please. So I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, we welcome your questions and also provide our email addresses at the end of this deck in the event that you have questions you'd prefer to ask privately. Um, and with that, I turn uh, the session back over to Dr. Gorham uh, and I look forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate both of your discussions, Zach and Elaine. How wonderful with the report and we look forward to reading it doing deep dives with it and has seen the kind of flexibilities that our plans and beneficiaries and providers can take advantage of. So we're going to start with Steve Green from Kim, from Kim Med. Steve, tell us about yourself and about Kim Med. Dr. Gorham, thanks so much. Um, appreciate the Better, Better Medicare Alliance uh, having us on and uh, talking about this important issue. Um, my name is Stephen Green. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at ChenMed. We're a unique organization. We're a, a provider organization, um, but really at our heart, uh, we take a lot of focus on technology and uh, have our own technology stack. And what we do is we operate specifically in Medicare Advantage 
across a dozen states, um, you know, a few dozen cities ranging from Florida, our home base, up through Philadelphia, and, and you know, have made our way about as far west as uh, St. Louis, Chicago, New Orleans areas. We do this exclusively in full risk arrangements. So um, our experience with COVID, um, I'll, I'll look forward to speaking about it, but obviously we were very worried about and we're very proactive about trying to take care of our patients. Um, our mission is that we honor seniors with affordable VIP care that delivers better health. And so you can see how central this uh, pandemic was to uh, what we do. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Steve and Lisa. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Gorham. Uh, my name is Lisa Trumbull. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer for Southern New England Healthcare Organization. We're a clinically integrated network uh, that's based in Massachusetts and Connecticut. We have uh, six, six hospitals in our system, about 1,700 providers. Uh, we focus entirely on value-based arrangements and specifically for this purpose, the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, so we have a unique comparison of Medicare Advantage to uh, our participation in Medicare Shared Savings, which is the fee-for-service uh, CMS program, where we had uh, differences of experience uh, that are important to this subject. So thank you for inviting me today. Absolutely. Dr. Sherman. Hi, I'm Paul Sherman. I'm a pediatrician by background. And uh, after residency, spent um, 26 years at Group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound as a clinician and administrator and helped shepherd um, the transition of Group Health to become part of Kaiser Permanente. And since then, for the last uh, almost three years, I've had the extraordinary good fortune to be the Chief Medical Officer at Community Health Plan of Washington. CHPW was started about 27 years ago by 20 FQHCs in the state of Washington to be their vehicle to do managed Medicaid. And that still is our primary um, line of business. But um, about six years ago, the patients wanted to stay on CHPW as they uh, graduated to Medicare. And so we have both a, a DSNP and a traditional MA plan um, with all of the patients based at CHCs, which provides unique opportunities and unique challenges. Well, you all have all had some unique challenges during 2020. The world has had unique challenges during 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to start with Stephen. Stephen, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you faced? Yes. I mean, they, they were extraordinary. Um, that's why they call it a pandemic. But um, we remember, and it's, it's, it's hard now because it's become so much of what we've done as this has persisted, um, albeit in different phases for over a year and a half, but uh, trying to bring back the memory of, of where we started and how we had to respond. I, I recall very early on um, just this conversation about what do we know about this virus? And the, the little bit that we knew was that it disproportionately affected the elderly. It disproportionately affected people who had comorbidities. And um, we didn't yet know how much that was going to uh, affect um, pre-existing health inequities with, with racial and ethnic minorities and other issues. But we looked at our patient population and said, that's everybody we serve. Literally our average patient is in their seventies, has five or more major chronic conditions. Um, you know, what are we gonna do to keep them safe? And so, we immediately created a task force that um, uh, I, I helped lead along with one of our physicians. I think that was one of the, the key lessons. I don't think you can, um, you can do this without physician leadership. I don't think you can do this with physicians alone and saying, solve it. Um, there's a lot of administrative elements as well. And so, uh, you know, for us, there was fundamentally a challenge around, could we reach and educate and communicate our patients. And the misinformation started fairly early in the pandemic and has persisted. So we really worked on how could we educate them and understand uh, for their safety, what to do, when to come to us, when to stay home, et cetera. We really wanted our own staff to also be safe. And so we recall, it, it, it almost feels like ancient memory, but recalling how hard it was to access PPE, how hard it was for patients to access things like toilet paper or hand sanitizer. 
Um, and so we really leapt into action on all of these fronts, uh, um, you know, trying to create uh, special uh, task forces, sub task forces around procurement, coordinating, coordinating and partnering with uh, health plan partners. If, if they were doing procurement of PPE, um, we stood up, uh, you know, a lot of bulk text messaging capabilities. We did a lot of uh, outreach to patients for, for communications and we established um, we really never shut our centers down. That was critical to us. We did not want our seniors, we wanted them to stay home. And that was in those early days of quarantine, but we did not want them to, to lack the ability to come in if something uh, was going to otherwise lead to their uh, hospitalization or, or something worse. Again, remembering we're at global full risk, meaning that whether it's COVID or whether it's their congestive heart failure or their COPD, any adverse outcome is something we worry about for their well-being and, and ultimately our economic alignment. So we created, um, you know, color coding tiers for our clinics and how much throughput you could have and how to keep people safe. And so those were all very challenging times early on. So those are, those are I think, some of the highlights that come to mind um, when you talk about the, the challenges with this. But Steve, so let me ask a question. So yeah. you had these, these challenging times with your, well, during COVID, but what did you actually tell your patients? You know, you have the uh, older patients who, uh, and how did you tell them? You had the older patients who still need to have their preventive health taken care of and still had to have their chronic diseases taken care of. How did you, and what did you do specifically to get those messages across to them? Right. So. We did uh, several things. One of uh, the earliest things we did was uh, a program called Love Calls. And um, we actually, over the pandemic, have created uh, seven, seven different specific types of outreach calls. Love Calls was the most common one. We, we made over 350,000 Love Calls. These are, these are people associated or loosely affiliated with the care team just reaching out and checking in on people. And originally it was how are you feeling? It was, do you understand the risks? It was, do you have toilet paper? It was those kinds of things and, th and they evolved over time. So that outreach, we, we went through different periods of how frequently we would text patients. Um, we would sometimes text about reminders of scams that were going on. Sometimes we would text uh, hygiene advice. It was a whole variety of, of things. Um, so that was a, a big piece. We also created a, a program that we called 3-H, um, Healthy, Happy, and at Home. And so we empowered, again, this is the beauty of Medicare Advantage and the beauty of being a provider in a capitated arrangement. We said, anything we can do that is cheaper than them being hospitalized, ventilated, and, and frankly, at risk of dying, which is the worst outcome of all, forget the financials, um, anything we can do that can reduce the odds of that, reduce the odds of catching COVID by grocery shopping or whatever, we really worked on that. So we, we empowered people, we, we tackled, uh, you know, home medication delivery, we tackled uh, some of the supplies. We frankly said, uh, we don't know exactly where the guidance is going to go on some of the safe harbors and, and all of the, uh, you know, uh, Medicare regulations, but let's err on the side of helping our patients. Um, and so that, uh, that 3-H program was a huge uh, piece of it uh, early on in terms of, you know, how we resolved it. And then we really did keep people coming in. We had a, a, an algorithmic approach to thinking about who, and we spotted some of this with love calls, but who, um, who needed to come in anyway? Where was the risk of staying home and being isolated actually worse? And um, I'm actually happy we just released some data that showed that um, in 2020, our performance of, against a few preventive metrics like breast cancer screening and A1C control um, exceeded by a good margin the industry averages pre-pandemic. So through the pandemic, we were able to still perform those necessary activities at a level that was in excess of um, average performance when people didn't even have the headwinds of the pandemic. Thank you, Steve. So Lisa, you're in Southern New England. And there's some very unique challenges being in New England, weather being one of them, among other things. Right. So talk to us a little bit about what your challenges were during 2020 and how you were able to 
have some flexibility for both the providers and the beneficiaries. Yeah, I, I think that we have a unique uh, perspective in this regard. Our organization is not a direct care provider. We're a, a value-based organization, a clinically integrated network. So we service hospital and provider practices. Uh, and we, we, similar to ChenMed, we're at risk for various programs or contracts like Medicare Advantage contracts and, and the like. So our, my team is a population health team that's focused around making those connections similar to what Chen Med does and um, managing patients uh, throughout their, their, you know, their care continuum. And uh, we have a unique experience in the fact that we do this not just for Medicare Advantage, but for Medicare fee-for-service and for commercial carriers. And uh, we had very different experiences. To give you a little sense of where we started from, uh, Southern New England Healthcare Organization was newly formed in January of 2020. I started on January 7th as the, the new president and chief executive officer. And then, you know, in March, um, the pandemic was like in full force here in New England. And I would say we had um, similar and different experiences in a couple of ways. In New England being the first area that was hit the hardest initially with the pandemic, we didn't have the same um, you know, speed to, uh, to resolution with things like payment, uh, payment terms or uh, the use of telehealth as quickly as maybe some of our counterparts uh, that live in different parts of the country. And so we found ourselves waiting for feedback from Medicare and from our commercial carriers on how we could actually uh, get exercised around resolving the issues our patients were facing. Our initial response, um, I think we started in four, four categories. Our initial response was, let's first make sure that our hospitals and our providers have what they need to do in order to manage their patient population. Our second response was, how do we how do we help them engage with patients in a way that doesn't require patients to come into the practice or into the hospital? So the telehealth, uh, virtual visits, phone calls, all of that uh, became very important. Thirdly, um, payment stabilization and infrastructure. So the, the organizations like ChenMed that have capitated arrangements with their global payments, that, that would have been extremely helpful for my organization because our, our providers were more worried about financial stability of their practice and more worried about whether they could keep their practice open during this time period. And Medicare Advantage programs have way more flexibility mm -hmm. in terms of payment structures as uh, you described earlier. However, in our market, in our region, our, our Medicare Advantage plans by and large don't use capitation. And during the course of the pandemic, we could not, they couldn't even think about how to get exercised around providing a cap payment, which would have been extremely helpful to our providers uh, during this time period. And then I would say the last um, component of our, of our response was actual management of the patient population. So similar to ChenMed, we had a number of outreach efforts. We deployed risk stratification. Uh, one of the one of one of the advantages of working with the Medicare Advantage program is that you know typically there's investments by the plan in care management and other tools that can be helpful to us, which is very different than what we had experienced with the Medicare fee for service population or the commercial population, where we ended up being actually the only response that they got. Um, so you know the I think the Medicare Advantage members did much better during this you know this pandemic in terms of outreach and touch points with plan uh, plan sponsors and, our, and, and providers than maybe the traditional uh, fee-for-service Medicare patient did or, um, or a commercial uh, patient. So Dr. Sherman, you've heard both Lisa and Stephen and what their challenges were. Did you see similar things in the state oh, of Washington? We did, absolutely. And if people remember the first patient in the US identified um, with COVID was in Snohomish, just north of Seattle. And the first uh, long-term care facility that COVID really went through and decimated the population was in Kirkland and just outside Seattle. And you think back to those days and as Steven said, how little we knew. And so things were crazy. And it was just trying to make sure that you got basic needs met. Um, you know, one of the first, you know, patients that we had to come up with basically heroic measures for, she was diagnosed with COVID and they wanted to get her out of the ER as fast as possible and said, go straight home, don't go anywhere else. But they gave her a prescription, paper prescription, not, right? So she calls us, 
I'm not allowed to leave the house. They tell me I'll be arrested if I leave the house. I have no food. I have no prescription and I need to start taking it. You know, so we got a local food bank um, to deliver boxes and leave them on her porch. Because remember, people were afraid like to even ring the doorbell. It's like, we don't know, and, and spraying stuff down. And, and uh, then one of our CHWs went out and picked up her prescriptions at the pharmacy and again, left them on the, the porch. And the, the dog food story was, was us, that local food banks were out of food and uh, out of dog food. So we got this, these, some of these patients food for themselves, but not for their pets. And so CHW called the local pet store and got food donated. Another great example of just how isolating it was. Um, we, one of our CHWs reached out to one of our 75 year old um, Medicare members and she had all of her basic needs met, but her cable had been cut off. And she said, I don't know how much longer I can take just staring at these walls by myself. And I, I, and um, clearly she was in pretty great distress. And our, and our outreach worker told her to go take a shower and call her back when she got out of the shower and she would see what she could do. And she called the cable company and got them to agree to turn back on her cable. Um, and so it was just trying to figure out in those early days. And, um, and our, uh, the FQHCs, in addition to meeting Medicare rules, they have to also meet all of HRSA's rules. And we're really afraid to do anything outside the bounds. And so um, it wasn't just that Medicare was so limited on audio visits. It was that Medicare early on prohibited um, origination sites from like the, all the providers went home, but they weren't allowed to do telehealth from home for Medicare. And so it was pushing with our with our lobbyists to get those rules changed. And we were communicating on a daily basis with providers about, all right, Medicare now says we can do this much more. So this is what you can do. And, um, and then bringing together all the providers to, to help share learnings. And um, it was fascinating early on what different decisions, you know, some people did all virtual and brought no one into the clinic. Other people tried to keep their clinics running and because um, they had elderly patients that had flip phones, if anything, and, and needed to keep them open for um, the less tech savvy patients. Uh, we made a big effort to get people who didn't have smartphones, um, smartphones through various programs. And uh, the other thing we did, again, because everything just shut, you know, being in, in so much uncertainty. And so we uh, noted that our sales staff was. Um, pretty idle because they weren't able to go out and, and be in the clinics and meet patients. So we had our care managers reach out by phone to all of our high-risk patients, but low-risk patients, um, whether they were Medicare, Medicaid, whatever, our sales staff were doing outreach and safety checks and, and had protocols for passing um, needs off or getting a care manager involved if that was necessary. And so um, we rapidly redeployed our, our sales staff to connect with everyone. The, the other thing still relatively early in the pandemic is that we don't have New England weather, but we have uh, forest fires. And last fall, um, you know, as the pandemic was raging, we had a really bad fire season in Eastern Washington. Um, and the smoke was, was all blowing uh, uh, west. And so even here in Seattle, we had visibility of like 10 feet out on the street often. So we had to not only um, mobilize um, texting and, and voice campaigns for the pandemic, but especially for our members with COPD or heart disease or other chronic lung disease to um, make sure that they were going to be taken care of, even if they didn't need to evacuate that across the whole state. Um, you know, the smoke uh, made uh, Spokane the, the most polluted city in the world uh, temporarily. So um, it was uh, reacting to multiple crises at the same time. You mentioned about changes within CMS like every day based on all three of y'all's experiences and the things that you all were 
fielding back to CMS and probably fielding back to your members of Congress because your beneficiaries are complaining to you and other care providers, the care providers are also complaining. So could you talk about what the federal government should be doing differently and better now since we've been through this pandemic over the last year and a half? I'll start with you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little quicker reaction, right? Um, you know, on, on many fronts, I, I know that's maybe an oxymoron when we're talking about the federal government and their ability to to move. But um, this was a real public health emergency, and we're still we're still going through it. And it, there, there didn't seem to be the level of reaction to match. Um, so, you know, being able to respond, uh, having clear information in, in a timely and quicker fashion, being clear around payment changes or changes in technology or services that are available, um, you know, the communication around, um, you know, testing and vaccination status was uh, added so much patient confusion to this mix. And uh, if we had a, the ability to respond quicker and we had the ability to actually respond in a cohesive and thoughtful manner um, it, with one voice, then I think it would have eliminated a lot of pain uh, on the provider side and the pain that the patients put up with in terms of just trying to understand who to trust with what information and where they should go. Uh, I, I think the fortunate thing with the Medicare Advantage plans is there's flexibility around how to manage the communications more so than you have with a typical Medicare program or um, in, in most often the commercial plans aren't, aren't focused in the same way. So we were able to standardize our communications uh, amongst our Medicare Advantage members and our Medicare members in general a little bit better than we were able to do with commercial plans. Uh, so I think the reaction, the response and clear communication and, um, uh, and you know, a, a single voice around how best to approach this and what to do during this time period would have been extremely helpful, number one. Number two, um, the payment methodology, I think, really needs a serious look. If there's any point in time in our, our, our industry where um, our fee-for-service payment methodology was shown to not work. This was one of them. And uh, the government needs to st stand behind and look at the payment methodology and understand what's the best way and the quickest way to transition to us something to transition us to something different that could stabilize our healthcare system, but also afford our providers to focus on the things that are more meaningful to patients um, than what would occur in a typical fee-for-service environment. Stephen, let's hear your comments. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to think about this. In, in, a, in the most tactical, I think Lisa really hit it with uh, payment. But if you step back, it's it, it's a really tough challenge. If you uh, we, we just heard the differences in New England, the Northwest, uh, we're in, in several different markets. We couldn't have a one size fits all solution. The government can't have a one size it's all solution, but if they can uh, create the opportunity for accountable organizations to do what is right for them and their patients and their and their well-being, uh, then I think that's the biggest thing. And, and when I look at what um, was most important for us, it was the it was the primary care physician patient relationship. So we have or over twenty health plans that we work with. So to try to say, what's the one answer from the health plan? Well, there's a lot of health plans. What's the, what's the, you know, and frankly, we only do Medicare Advantage. What if we also did Medicaid and commercial and, and, and self-funded employers and all these things? So um, the patient though, the relationship with the doctor is, is so critical. The, the patients that we were able to get vaccinated despite all the information around it, the patients that we were able to get to wear masks despite all the information, uh, misinformation around it, that relies on that primary care uh, physician relationship. And we even had um, some evidence that our patients who got COVID did better with COVID. And we believe that's largely because their uh, comorbidities were more well managed. So somebody with COPD or diabetes who has you know, A1C out of control and gets COVID is gonna do worse than somebody who's got diabetes, but at least they're at you know, seven or something for their A1C. So. So again, where does that come from? It comes from a relationship with a primary care doctor who is managed, who is first identifying all of the, the issues with the patient, 
been managing and building a relationship and, and trust. And so I think the number one thing is, you know, can we create programs where we encourage or incentivize, I won't necessarily go so far as to say mandate, but it's an unpopular word these days, but um, to, to have patients have a primary care physician. And most MA plans have you select a primary care physician. And, and that's a big deal. We have small panels. We have only 400 patients or so per physician. So they get to really know them. They see them frequently. They build trust. Um, that's enabled us to um, have that uh, uh, disease management control going in. It enabled us to have them make smart and, and safe choices during COVID. It enabled us to get very high vaccination rates amongst a population that is very, uh, you know, much less likely to be vaccinated. And we see even our, our Medicaid, Medica uh, Medicare, Medicaid duals are being vaccinated at almost exactly the same rate, maybe one or two points different from our, our uh, Medicare patients who are not dual eligible. And when you look at the average Medicaid uh, vaccination rates versus the, the general community, you see a, a very wide difference. And so again, I think that all stems from this uh, PCP physician relationship. If you can get the payment, that Lisa was talking about, if you can get people to be in that relationship, and then the PCP is going to do what's right. They know, they're connected, it's more personalized. Um, so, so that's what I think Medicare Advantage can allow. And, and that's probably the right answer more than the federal government getting too particular about well, one size fits all solution for how to actually uh, you know, deliver the, um, the patient care or anything like that. Well, I was, I was hoping that there would have been some more flexibility as you all had talked about earlier in terms of the providing health care, patient providing direct care from the physician to the beneficiary. Um, talk a little bit about that flexibility a little bit more and, and how would, I'm going back again to Congress, to CMS, and even to HRSA when we were dealing with the FQHCs, how should that flexibility have opened up um, payments to the provider and better healthcare services to the beneficiary. Dr. Sherman. Yeah, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but, and I, I know that CMS for good reason is critically concerned with balancing um, member rights and privacy and against fraud, waste and abuse with giving us flexibility. But, um, Obviously, I want them to err more on the side of flexibility um, because it was so much easier to take care of our other members than Medicare Advantage during the, the pandemic, especially initially. And it sounds like Medicare is thinking of the flexibilities they eventually granted, making many of them permanent, um, and we're advocating for that. But it's the idea that, that um, since we were founded by the FQHCs and are still governed by them, our dual mission is to support the most vulnerable in society, but also to support the CHCs in doing that. And so, as I said, I was communicating and trying to make sense out of all of this stuff. And it was crazy making because um, Washington State is really liberal with, even before the pandemic, with telehealth or Medicaid. And so I could tell that the CHCs, I, I can pay you for anything you bill for Medicaid. Now for Medicare Advantage, it's changing on a daily basis, but it's still pretty restricted. And you can do, but you can do these things for your Medicare Advantage patients, but you can't do them for Medicare fee for service because they haven't loosened that. They've just given us some more flexibility. And as Lisa said, every commercial payer is different. So good luck with that. I can't even begin to help you with that. Um, it was, it was crazy making for me, but for providers, it, you know, trying to figure out what they could do for which patient when. Um, and so the more that, that um, well, I'm a big fan of getting everyone into Medicare Advantage, but, but the, the, the more flexibility so that we can meet the members' needs, we can meet the providers' needs. A huge part of it is trying to be flexible for providers. Again, like on the payment side, we have huge flexibility in Medicaid and for, um, for clinics that weren't already on a full cap or they were on a full cap for, for some of their membership but not all of it, we were able to just say, you know what, we're gonna do a pseudo cap 
and pay you as much money as we did in the first quarter of last year, because you're going to go bankrupt and lay off all your staff otherwise. So we could do that on Medicaid, but obviously not on Medicare, given all of the complexities and rules. And so it was trying to figure out how we could advance people money, how, and again, pushing what we could pay them for to try to keep them afloat there as well. I wanted to bring Zach and Elaine back into the narrative that we have here and find out if there are any questions, Zach and Elaine, that you would like to ask of our three panelists. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, one initial question that we have here that we've asked uh, to all of the interviewees that we talked to is, um, you know, about the future and, and how Medicare needs to deal with the next potential crisis or next pandemic. And, you know, I, I, I would like it if you could speak to quickly just kind of how Medicare should continue to evolve. You talked about coverage of, you know, more virtual care and expanding the flexibilities on a permanent basis. But what other ideas do you have that, uh, that the Medicare program could consider? So uh, let me maybe take a first stab at this. Uh, part of my reasoning for bringing up the financial structure of uh, how Medicare operates today is that I think at, at the end of the day, when we look back at the experience, we'll find that Medicare Advantage plans and the patients that were in Medicare Advantage plans by and large had better outcomes, providers had better experience because they had the num number one had resources at the plan. They were all geared around the whole person and, and how to manage the entire person. And there was payment flexibility and also operational flexibility on how to manage the patient and how to bring in additional tools from community-based organiz organizations to help resolve issues that, that beneficiaries were facing. That doesn't exist in a traditional fee-for-service model. And, and part of the reason that, you know, organizations like ChenMed, because I, I really believe in that model, um, you know, having a global capitated arrangement, I'm not saying it's good for everybody everywhere, you know, there, there needs to be some variation in that, but that allowed the organization to step back and think about how to deliver care differently, even though it may not, you know, certain activities were not paid for you know, because it was covered in a, a global cap arrangement. In a fee-for-service environment, the entire provider community is focused on what can I see, what can I bill for, who can I get in, who can I touch, who can I do a telehealth visit for, and not how do I holistically take care of my patient population because I'm more worried about just the financial stability of my practice. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. That's just the, the economic structure that we built. And it, it doesn't work in a pandemic situation. It doesn't work for managing populations uh, because it doesn't, create a situation where uh, providers and those that are responsible for managing care have a need to make connections to community-based organizations, have a need to work with the plans in terms of understanding how best to manage the population, or, that, or even a need to connect with the rest of the continuum to manage that individual's healthcare experience. Um, if, if, we, if we don't figure out that part of the structure, then we will, we will live with fragmentation in, in the way that we saw it, you know, through this pandemic. I, I think it's incredibly important to address that in some way, shape or form for the Medicare population going forward. Because once that's done, then we can decide you know, many other things can be accomplished underneath it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think nobody wants to talk about the finances when you're talking about taking care of people, especially vulnerable, People, you want to say, do the right thing, take care of them. But the reality of different financial arrangements creates different behaviors. And to be blessed by being in Medicare Advantage with global risk arrangements, where we had 0.0% of our doctors asking, can I bill for this? Because there is no billing for this. We simply said, get on the phone and talk to them or get online. And yes, like certain flexibilities to waive some of the HIPAA requirements so we could say, how do you talk to your grandkids? Oh, I have this app called whatever. Okay, let's do it. We also had a lot of patients who didn't have access to high-speed internet or those kind of devices. And then again, to have the flexibility to say, um, 
you know, should, should we get a device to them? How should we manage it? We ran pilots that we sort of called the Netflix model or the Milkman model and different ways to try to do this. But, but that flexibility is huge. And um, the reality is that each, each patient needs something different. Their clinical and social needs vary. And clearly their total health is related to their social needs. And so if you can give people a budget, a capitation, to deal with something, and then they can decide what's right. And you worry a lot less about the fraud, waste, and abuse that, that Paul was mentioning, because uh, nobody at risk wants to waste money that's out of their own pocket. People will waste money from somebody else's pocket, um, and that's what fee for service is. It's it's the government and the taxpayer's pocket. But if it's your budget, you want to do the right thing. And so I think getting that in place is just really the biggest thing they can do because it will enable folks to um, do the population care management advance, connect the dots for social determinants of health, um, prepare them, and then give them the flexibility if, God forbid, you really need to go crazy because, you know, some, something turns the world upside down with another pandemic. It's never going to be uh, perfect, but I think that's, that's a big thing just to piggyback on Lisa's uh, uh, answers. And then, you know, I, I think really for the government to think about what ought to be federal and what ought to be state. Some of the challenges with vaccine rollout and, and the state level was very, very challenging for us being in 10 different states. We're in 12 now, but, um, you know, we had 10, um, you know, to actively do this with. That was very hard. Um, so there's this balance. Sometimes local is better and sometimes federal is better. And so for them to think about which fits which in advance would, would really be helpful. The only thing I, I'd add, and I think Lisa and Stephen both touched on this, was that is that um, even before the pandemic, we were all moving more towards thinking about um, true whole person care, social determinants of health, that your zip code is more important than your genetic code in terms of your health and your lifespan, and how we address that. And CMS is making some movements along that, but it's still, well, if you, if you've offered it as an official supplemental benefit or still has all of these rules that, that stop us from being able to be flexible um, when we identify a need that is going to impact um, a member's health significantly. You know, we now have a, a wildfire emergency. We have some patients that we know if we don't get air filters to them, um, they're gonna end up in the hospital. But well, wait, is this a patient we're allowed to cover it on or do we have to find someone else to get it to them um, because we don't obviously want to break the rules? And how do we keep moving uh, CMS to, to really look at, at whole person care? Um, we are so much better at it in Medicare Advantage, obviously, than in fee-for-service, which is still a very medical model. Um, and and it's amazing, and as the other speakers have said, I think it's gonna show that we had such better outcomes because we were able to really address all the patient's needs, not just their medical needs. Elaine, was there a question you wanted to throw out? Um, no, for the sake of time, I think we're, we're good to go. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just gonna throw it out one more time. If there's something that you want changed, that one best practice from your own organization or an organ, another organization that you might have seen using uh, Medicare Advantage and how they were able to work with the beneficiaries as well as the patients, what one thing would that be? Lisa, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, oh boy, I was just thinking about that. So that was pretty quick. Uh, you know, maybe this isn't exactly the answer you're looking for, but I think if there was one thing I would change, if we want to look at disparities in healthcare, uh, we know that trying to resolve disparities amongst multiple payer formats, right? Uh, commercial, Medicare, Medicare Advantage is challenging. But if, if we really want to resolve uh, disparities in care and end up with healthier outcomes, uh, healthier patients, then maybe in the Medicare population, we ought to look at the disparities in the payment structure and the program structure. 
right? Because Medicare itself is perpetuating disparities by maintaining different structures for Medicare Advantage and Medicare fee-for-service patients. And, you know, I understand that that's a big problem to try to resolve, um, but there's a lot of business that's in that one domain um, that if we were really looking to transform healthcare, that concentrating in that space uh, to try to get some consistency uh, across our Medicare population, I think would be a big advantage to patients and the industry overall. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Sherman. I think that we've talked about this some, but the most important change that's come and needs to stay with us is the switch to telehealth and um, making sure that we maintain flexibility while protecting um, providers and patients um, that, and that we need to understand as it evolves around um, appropriate payment, et cetera, and not to put too much into, um, into legislation because that's gonna stifle um, creativity. For example, in Washington state, again, with the Medicaid population, um, we're trying to stop it from being permanently enshrined or semi-permanently in legislation that telehealth visits are paid at the same as in-person visits, period. That's what we're doing right now. It's a great idea right now. But if you say that that has to go on forever, the promise of telehealth was that it was gonna help uh, healthcare be more affordable. Visits should be cheaper over time. And it will hurt providers in the long run if we keep up with those rules because the in-person providers, we would have to continue to pay them one rate for both a telehealth visit and an in-person visit. So what are savvy insurance companies gonna do? They're gonna contract with a telehealth only provider at a much lower rate for those visits because they're paying them the same rate for, for all visits. And um, that would fundamentally disrupt the primary care relationship and would not be in the interest of the patients or the providers. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, so if you'll allow me maybe uh, to, um, <laughs> I think the first thing that, you know, we haven't talked a lot about that I just, I wanted to say because I think it's so important if we're, if we're going to focus on one thing is um, there needs to be a much, much larger supply of qualified primary care uh, physicians in America. We are so biased towards specialty care, so biased towards interventions and procedures, um, and just, you know, all the way upstream from saying, how do we get a broader swath of people to want to go into medicine than just the high IQ kind of people that can, you know, um, pass, uh, you know, organic chemistry and take the MCAT and do all that sort of stuff. There, being a physician in primary care is largely about relationships and behavior change. And there's a lot of amazing people out there that can, that can participate in that. So how do we increase that supply and get them exposed to practicing in a value-based world where they learn what it means not to maximize a fee schedule, but learn what it means to, to do this whole person care. If we could have a world where there was more primary care physicians doing that, then and I think that would be my number one. But my, my one A, if I could do this second one, is just it piggybacks off of the uh, the economic uh, structures and the financial incentives and stuff. Yeah, we have to be able to um, first give that global budget to a provider and then empower them to make choices. I, I struggle to see how a plan at bid season is going to know whether or not to put air filters in their plan design. I struggle to, to see how a plan will know if they ought to cover handrails in the home or not. And, so just let the provider decide and, and, and ultimately give a budget that's appropriate to the, to the uh, relative risk of the population of who they're caring for. Uh, an individual living in a, a rural place, uh, you know, suburbanite, uh, you know, an urban uh, uh, center, they're different. And, you know, whether they have access to uh, healthy food, healthy walking spaces, all these kinds of things are going to change the tools you have as a provider to take care of that individual and change the relative expense likelihood of what it's going to take to intervene and, and create health. And so if this government is serious about reducing health equity or health inequity and promoting health equity, then um, 
I think it actually will take investment and a willingness to pay more on a global budget basis to then empower physicians with these kinds of decisions about what incentives or what uh, extra things are needed to take care of their health. Um, and, you know, I understand the trust fund challenges. And so obviously then the question is, you know, where does it come from? And maybe there are people that um, we overpay for, but it, it doesn't have to all be equal because we're taking care of a diverse population of people and let's invest in, and put the resources into the people whose health is, um, is, is sorely lacking and the, you know, life expectancy gaps between, you know, as, as Paul said, the zip code versus the genetic code, we, we have to tackle that. So um, that would sort of be my 1A related to uh, uh, payment, appropriate sort of global budget per patient that is uh, relevant to, to their true situation and the empowerment of the physician. Um, so you want me to take those two, that would be my answer. Thank you so much, Stephen. So on behalf of the Better Medicare Alliance, I would like to thank Zach Gauman, Elaine Henry of Health Management Associates, Stephen Green of Chin Med, Lisa Trumbull of Southern New England Health, and Dr. Paul Sherman of the Community Health Plan of Washington for being a part of this wonderful session on COVID and managing our Medicare patients through COVID and best use of Medicare Advantage. Thank you all so much for being a part of our session and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.